This week's episode of the Art Tactic Podcast is brought to you by Artbase. Are you managing an art collection or an artist studio or a gallery? Is it time to bring your collection management skills up to a professional level? Well, Artbase is the right software to manage your art business. Artbase allows you to track your artworks and contacts in an easy-to-use, powerful database. Enter your data once, and you can use that data to generate reports, offers, contracts, and so much more. They've got a brand new version out with a whole new look that can be used on the cloud from any location on any device. So what are you waiting for? Go to artbase.com today to learn more and be sure to mention Art Tactic for a 15% discount. Thanks for listening to the Art Tactic podcast. I'm your host, Adam Green. Hope everyone's doing well and staying safe. Well, the latest COVID situations in different countries vary widely. I have to say that here in New York City, it feels like we're finally turning a corner and heading back to some level of normalcy. I just read that 50% of adults in New York City now have had at least their first vaccine shot. Indoor dining is back, so we can start really enjoying some of the incredible restaurants here. The weather is starting to turn really nice. And in terms of the arts, while galleries and museums have been open since September, which is really amazing, there's a buzz around the art world this week with Freeze New York. The art fair opens in early May, and it's the first in-person art fair in the United States in 2021. And it isn't just the fair that people are excited about, but it feels like it's going to be a great week with so many art-related activities. You have the fair, you have the galleries, which are all open, and there are so many incredible exhibitions coinciding with the week. You have the post-war and contemporary auction previews at Christie's and Sotheby's, and there are numerous fantastic museum exhibitions. And I've been having a lot of conversations with galleries and collectors trying to deduce who is going to travel to New York City for this week. And I'm hopeful that a lot of people will make it, especially for collectors within the U.S. who aren't based in New York City but have been vaccinated. They've been waiting over a year to travel to see great art. So we're hopeful we'll see a lot of familiar faces. And I know one aspect of the week that some people are having a little bit of hesitancy about, or at least some uncertainty, is the Freeze Art Fair, which will be occurring from May 5th to May 9th. And it's moved this year from Randall's Island to The Shed, which is located in Hudson Yards in Manhattan, just a few minutes north of Chelsea. Some questions pe- that are on people's minds. What will an in-person art fair experience be like? How safe will it be? Will it feel like art fairs of the past? These are some of the questions that people are thinking about, and so we wanted to chat with someone from Freeze to answer these questions. So in this week's episode, we chat with Lauren Randolph, Director of Programming at Freeze New York. We hope you enjoy our conversation with Lauren, and thanks so much again for downloading and listening. Lauren, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So Freeze New York is next week from May 5th to May 9th. It'll be the first in-person art fair in the U.S. this year. I know a lot of people will be watching the fair to see if everything goes smoothly and what the response is from collectors and galleries. I'm feeling pretty optimistic. I'm really hopeful that it's going to be a great fair and a lot of people who are willing and able to travel will visit the fair especially collectors based in the U.S. And even beyond the fair, I think it has the potential to be a truly outstanding week in New York City for the arts. In addition to the fair, there are so many great gallery exhibitions that are opening next week. There are a number of outstanding museum shows currently on view, and you also have the auction previews at the auction houses for their major post-war contemporary auctions. So anyone who visits won't have an issue staying busy. Before we get into some of the details about the fair, can you share with us how much deliberation was there, whether this fair was going to happen or not, and what was the decision like to eventually move forward and say, we're going to do this and have this fair in person this year? I think everybody was hopeful that something, you know, that in the spring in 2021, we were going to enter this period of like renewal, you know, and we were sort of going to be emerging out of the covid um coma that you know and the tragedy that's plagued the country for the last year or longer um and when we had to cancel freeze new york you know freeze new york 
just kind of is one of the earlier fairs to kick off the year, right? So in 2020, we were one of the first to be canceled. Um, so I think we've had, you know, time to think and to plan. And the only way to proceed was to proceed, you know, in the way that we would have thinking that the fair was going to happen. Um, obviously, we we did shift venues. We are now at the shed um, in the Bloomberg building on the west side of Manhattan. And within that shift meant that we scaled the fair down a lot. So on Randall's Island, it, you know, the fair is about 200 galleries and the shed is about 60 galleries. Um, and being obviously in a building and having the infrastructure and the um, everything that goes along with that just means different things for us in terms of, you know, how we can comply with rules and regulations and what we can do in terms of health and safety. Um, so when, you know, when that development happened this fall, um, I guess we were more hopeful that we would be able to have an event that would take place in May. So what can visitors expect this year in terms of safety measures for the fair? What's required of attendees? And are there other things that you've implemented that will make visitors feel extra safe, especially those who maybe are a little bit uneasy about being indoors with a large group of people? Yeah, of course. Um, so we, we do have obvious health and safety measures in place to minimize the risk of COVID-19 to all, all of the people who are going to be in the shed. That includes visitors, galleries, and staff members. Um, and so what we are doing is for everyone really who is going to be within the building of the shed, they are required to either prove that they have had a negative PCR test obtained within 72 hours of their visit or proof that they ha are fully vaccinated and that they have been fully vaccinated for 14 days or more ahead of the um, ahead of the entry date or whenever they would be coming on site, if that would be during installation or if they were a visitor, if that would be any day that the fair would be open. And, you know, alongside with that, we, we have um, testing available on site for all exhibitors and staff, and that will be also including installation and deinstallation days. Um, and we will have you know, daily health and safety screenings. And that I think everybody's pretty familiar with that. You know, that's like the temperature check at the front desk and contact tracing and things like that. Um, and of course, everybody on site must wear a face mask at all times. There's no exceptions to that. Um, there's no food on site for the most part. So, um, you know, there's not there's not really an opportunity where someone could sit down and take their mask off and say like, oh, well, I'm you know, now I'm eating my lunch and so I'm taking it off. It's like, that's not, that's not the way that it's going to work. Um, uh, and we also have, you know, obvious other things in place. Hand sanitation sites will be available all over the venue. The shed has an amazing ventilation system and it's fitted with a MERV 16 filtration. So ambient air kind of turns over in all of the spaces at least once every hour. And we have an, a compliance team. We will be doing a lot of um, on-site cleaning. And, you know, hopefully with all of that in place, it's going to, we're going to minimize everybody's risk to the virus. And um, as I think for anyone, we're one of the first events happening and we're really committed to ensuring that we're delivering a safe, safe um, environment for everybody. It's a condensed version of the fair this year, and by that I mean there are significantly less galleries exhibiting than in previous editions. How many galleries are there going to be, and what were galleries' attitudes about participating? Because I could see galleries really wanting to exhibit, especially because it's been a year since we've had an in-person art fair, so it's a great opportunity to visit with clients. But I can also understand if some were hesitant, or maybe they're coming from other countries where they're still struggling with COVID. Yeah, I mean, I think we had to get out in front of that when we were rolling in over the next couple, over the last few months, and there were still some pretty heavy travel restrictions in place for people coming from the UK and from Europe and other areas of the world. Um, so we just stayed in close contact with everybody, um, with all the galleries, kind of continually speaking to them about how they were feeling about it. Um, you know, whether or not they thought they were actually going to be able to make it here. And of course, some of them ended up not being able to come. And there were people, there are, there were a lot of other galleries who had wanted to do the fair previously who were not allowed um, to, well, not allowed is a, is a weird term, but they, they were not either 
admitted initially or they were not original applicants to Randall's Island because one of the one of the criteria for being able to apply to the shed this year was that you had already applied to the fair on as it would have existed on Randall's Island. Um, so it, that eliminated obviously a lot of other galleries who potentially wanted to do the fair but um, had not originally applied. And so, you know, we ended up kind of loosening that um, as we had conversations with galleries from overseas just about whether or not they were actually going to be able to make it. And, you know, we brought in some of the galleries that had, had asked to um, participate who were not eligible because they hadn't applied previously. As I said, I think it's going to be a really exciting week for the arts in New York City. And so I'm hopeful a lot of people will be traveling to the city. I know you're already distributing tickets for the fair to visitors. Are you expecting a lot of visitors from outside of the New York City area? And what about from outside of the U.S.? We've had a pretty good response to, um, you know, galleries nominating VIPs for the previews. Um, And we, I think... You know, a lot of people have apartments in New York. A lot of people have pet or their ex, you know, they, they have a home here. So I think that um, we will get people from out of town, um, from overseas. And now that the travel restrictions are lifting a little bit and people, you know, can apply to come in a little bit easier. Um, uh, but I think for the most part, you know, the fair is going to be pretty local in terms of attendance. Um, But that said, there's so many great collectors. There's so many amazing institutions in New York City. Um, If we even get, you know, a tenth of all those people to come, we'll be in pretty good shape. I know we touched on the safety measures you're taking and also that there will be less galleries than in previous years. But beyond that, will the actual experience of seeing the art, visiting with galleries, meeting other collectors, is there anything else that will be different this year or will it feel the same like an old art fair? There won't be any hugging and kissing. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, we're all like pretty used to that not happening at this point. Um, And I think, you know, people are just, I, I do feel like people are ready to interact again in person. I think people are you know, still very responsible. And I don't think that, you know, I think you'll, I think you'll just feel a a little bit of a different vibe that people are cautious, you know, proceeding with caution, um, but excited to be there. And hopefully, you know, hopefully people will support the galleries and the artists and acquire works and do so in a way that is socially distanced and responsible. And lastly, can you tell us about some of the art that will be on view at the fair? And also, will there be the normal programming that ordinarily accompanies the fair? Yeah, thanks for asking. I mean, I had to really rethink programming this year. We were lucky enough to be able to move almost all of our programming online in May in 2020. Um, But, you know, going forward and being in the situation that we were in, um, it didn't feel like I, I guess I just started asking myself questions over the summer and I and I and there are some silver linings to um, to the pandemic and the effect that, you know, we all got to gain back a little bit of time. So I just had more time to do some more kind of serious research. So for programming specifically, um, uh, one of the things I thought about was like, how could we move beyond the gallery booth? is there something that we could do that would really unite like all of Freeze New York's constituents together um, under one mission or, um, or could we do programming in a way that was more educational? And so I, um, you know, with that all kind of in mind as the central strand of the curated programming at Freeze New York this year, we're, we are paying tribute to um, Professor Sarah Lewis and her multifaceted initiative vision and justice, the vision and justice project. Um, and this is going to be a kind of really ambitious program that all, a lot of the galleries have worked on. Over 50 galleries have contributed and um, multiple institutions also in New York City have contributed to it. And, and in that sense, they have done, um, you know, they've contributed talks. They're showcasing exhibitions or artworks. Um, they are showcasing texts and, and all of this will, um, kind of 
lead up to and and speak to the the Vision and Justice Project mission, which, if you don't know, is um, it's a educational force really that's dedicated to examining our central role, role in understanding the relationship between race and citizenship in the United States. Um, and it started as an issue of Aperture magazine. In, uh, and actually, actually, it was an award-winning issue of Aperture Magazine in 2016, and it's expanded since then. Um, but I, this is something that I'm like particularly really proud of and really excited about. And on site at the fair, there will be um, artist commissions by Terry May Weems and Hank Willis Thomas, as well as um, other artworks on view, specifically um, to come to mind, Sanford Biggers at Massimo de Carlo and Stan Douglas with David Zwerner. Um, and then there'll be a lot of other images and information online. Um, and we're going to obviously publish the full list of events and things as well. Um, in addition to that, Professor Lewis has also organized a, um, uh, a talk that is about, well, that will bring together and be about um, black cultural leadership in the US. And that will include um, Ava DuVernay, who is the director of Selma, um, Franklin Leonard, who is the founder and CEO of The Blacklist, um, Wynton Marsalis, who is a jazz musician, and artist The Astor Gates and Carrie Mae Weems. So that's kind of a star-studded, um, <laughs> star-studded event that um, I think deserves some uh, a highlight. And on top of that, we, like I said, in terms of the 60-something galleries, the way that the fair is actually going to be laid out at the shed is going to be the galleries that are just in the main section of the fair and then galleries that are in the frame section of the fair. And if you, if you remember what the fair was like on Randall's Island, we had a lot of other sections. We had, you know, we had focus spotlight. Um, we had the, the section dedicated to um, artists of Latin descent, um, Dialogos. Um, and so, in in the fair this year, it's actually just going to be main and then frame, which is our galleries that are 10 years or younger. So, and and they will only be so, showing solo presentations. Um, I'm particularly excited about, you know, Annette Messiger is doing a solo um, booth at Marianne Goodman. She's obviously an iconic figure um, for conceptual and feminist practices. Um, uh, David Werner is showing new works by Dana Schutz, James Cohan. Uh, is showing new paintings by Trenton Doyle Hancock. Listen is kind of at the more classical end of the spectrum and doing a solo with Daniel Buren. Um, and in frame, I'm excited about Dana Locke, who is presenting a new work with Klima Gallery from Italy. Um, and also Olga Belema, who I think a lot of people already know, is showing with um, Bridget Donahue and Hannah Hoffman. So there's going to be some good good presentations around. I think one of the interesting things about being the first fair to reopen is that people kind of had a chance to rethink maybe a little bit what they wanted to show because so much had been canceled over the last year. So I think I'm really glad that maybe galleries will have the opportunity and artists will have the opportunity to have their work seen in person where it wasn't, they weren't able to do that um, as easily over the last year. All of that sounds great. We're really looking forward to the fair and seeing everyone. And if our listeners are still considering attending the fair, what's the website they can visit to learn more? They just need to go to www.freeze.com. And the information is right there on the homepage. Perfect. Thanks so much, Lauren, for coming on and chatting with us about the, what the fair will be like this year. We're so excited that there's going to be an in-person fair again soon. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and thanks for having me again, and hope to see you soon. Thanks so much to Artbase for sponsoring this week's episode of the podcast. Are you managing an art collection, an artist studio, or gallery? Is it time to bring your collection management skills up to a professional level? Well, Artbase is the right software to manage your art business. Artbase lets you track your artworks and contacts in an easy-to-use, powerful database. Enter your data just once and use that data to generate reports, offers, contracts, and much more. They've got a brand new version out with a whole new look that can be used on the cloud from any location on any device. So what are you waiting for? Go to artbase.com, that's A-R-T-B-A-S-E dot com to learn more, and be sure to mention Art Tactic for a 15% discount.